What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Corey Turkey, AKA Bones the Goat. We're back here with another episode of Conversations That Cure. Before we get to introduce you to who I have to my media, right? We're gonna skip over one and go to my boy. I'm Michael Ryder, AKA Ryder Grooms. I'm Gregory, AKA Dad. Pops, pops, pops. So as you can see, we have another person on the show with us today. This is somebody who I've known for was it 13? Yeah, About 13, almost 14 years now. And I can honestly say, it's, it's, it's rare that you meet somebody that they're the same exact person that they were when you first meet them till now, no matter how much you've changed or how much they've changed and what life has thrown at them. And I can honestly say that Kino, for a period of time in my life, outside of my dad was somebody that I considered to be like a father figure of mine, you know, because I've always respected his character, the type of father he was, and also, he's a barber. <laughs> so that was the commonality between the, between the two of us. We worked together at a barber shop back in the day, and Kino kind of came in and, I, for whatever reason, we just clicked, man. He kind of took me under his wing, and ever since then, it's been nothing but love. We can go, it's been times we've went a year without speaking to each other but you know you just got those people that it don't matter and once you get back in their presence it's just it's immediately love so i want to introduce to y'all um my big brother and one of i would say one of my you know uh fatherly mentors mm -hmm. if i could if, if i had to put a title on it my boy kino valley aka humbly the greatest on social media so the reason why kino's here big part is obviously I wanted him on the show, but more specifically, my dad did. And it stemmed from a video that Kino put up a couple of weeks ago. So with that being said, Dad, I want you to kind of, you take the lead and let us, let, us, let us see what, you know, that video, what it spoke to you for. And then Kino, you know, let's get into it. Well, you know, it, it's, Kino got on there and he said he was um, in the gym and he began to talk about this is his, his like 25th startup, meaning that he didn't did this before over and over again, and he's back at it. And he said, key things to me, he said that he was being transparent, he was vulnerable, and he needed somebody to hold him accountable. <clears throat> and the thing that I thought that was so good was that now he's a very successful speaker and barber. And he put his health first. He was saying, I'm getting back to me. And I thought that, you know, that was so great because as men, a lot of men we, we, will get caught up in trying to take care of everybody, trying to take care of the families and everything, trying to live up to people's expectations and everything. And we'll forget about what's really important. The thing that was important was self and to see him say what he said really stood out to me because i mean at his level of success you know it's especially in this field the barber field you don't <clears> see <throat> that a lot you don't see and you don't hear it and then he also said you had said that you were um you felt that as a man you felt that you was alone and those things rang they rang in my um ear and i i i said we have to have him on the uh, podcast because we need to hear where you was at and what brung you to that point. You want me to explain? Yes. All right, so um, it really was starting with COVID, right? So COVID uh, changed up a lot. I mean, I mean, I, the most I liken it to is, you know, I was traveling the world before COVID mm -hmm. and I went from traveling the world to traveling my living room. Facts. And that was a hard thing to deal with, you know what I mean? So I'm here, the kids are home, you know, I'm trying to, you know, redevelop that connection with them. My wife is, is working. There's really not enough money coming in on my side. You know, it's a big break there. I'm not going to the barbershop because of the situation. So I'm not really pulling in money. And here's the big caveat. We were purchasing a home. And if by anybody knows, when you purchase a home, your circumstance can't change so I was just in my head just analyzing back and forth back and forth back and forth 
and it just put me in a space that my wife tried to get me out of uh, that she couldn't. I mean, I said that to her, and it, it hurt her. I had to apologize later on for that, but I, she says, I'm trying to help you, and I just looked at her and I said, you can't. Mm. So, you know, I was just in a, in a bad place, man, like, mm -hmm. and, and it just kind of messed me up for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I was like that, to be honest with you, man, for like <laughs> man, three years, man, two and a half, three years. I would come out, go back in, come out, go back in. So it, it all stemmed from COVID and just, I guess, think that was just the point where everything was messing with me, you know what I mean? Okay. And I was trying to be, you know, a father, a husband, a Christian, uh, a mentor, a motivational speaker, a barber, all these things, all, and, and I had just given so much of myself that COVID helped me realize that I had nothing left for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You had yeah. built. So humbly, the greatest had got built so much, you know, and I, you know, we relate to that. We spoke about that in episodes prior to it was like we focus so much on building this image that we feel everybody in our family needs to see or the world needs to see. And then, nigga, when you go home and get in that bathroom and you look in that mirror, it's like, I ain't got shit left for me. Yeah, I got nothing left for me. But then you feel that responsibility or the expectation as a man is like, I don't have nothing for me, but I know no matter what tomorrow, I have a responsibility to show up. Yeah. And what I loved about that, that clip that you said in it, it was like, this is day 25 and there may be a 26. Yep. Yeah. Hopefully there isn't, but if there is a 26, a 27, a 28, 29 or 30, the most important thing about it is is that you still showing up. Yes. And I was having a conversation with somebody last night and it's wild that we, we talk about this right now. It's like, we have, to, we have to stop focusing on the quality of how we show up and focus on the, the, the most important thing is the consistency in showing up. You know, if the perfect, I'm having a conversation with one of my homegirls, she's an artist. And I said, yo, you should try to post a, a, some artistic things once a week. And in her mind, being an artist, it went to a canvas. I gotta be inspired. I gotta have crazy colorway. The content that I do has gotta be amazing. I said, no, you're missing my point. You're missing my point. And I said, I'm speaking to you just as much as I'm speaking to myself, because I'm hard on myself as well. And I was like, if only thing you got this week is your signature, that's a piece of art. And yes. post it. And I have to sit back, and we gotta sit back and think about like, Every day, I'm not gonna be able to run a 4-2 on the 40. No. Some days I'm gonna run a fucking 5-6. But the objective is I showed up to run. I showed up to run. Yes. I think I got, I think one thing that I got from your video and, and my biggest question that I had for you today was like, so you said you were in a messed up place mm -hmm. and, I, and I can relate with that. I've been through those over, over the past couple of years, whatnot. My biggest question was, so and I seen you in the gym, obviously in that video. What was it? What was that point where you finally were like, all right, like I feel like I'm getting over that hump or getting out of that mindset? Like, what was the thing that really started getting those wheels turning to get you into a more positive situation? Well, I mean, it, I have to probably say it was my wife, what? right? So don't get me wrong. You know, I said in the video that she was trying to hold me accountable, but I wasn't listening. Mm -hmm. So that's important. We gotta be honest with ourselves. People shouldn't have to tell us that, right? So I was honest my, with myself and saying, you know what, I wasn't listening to what she was saying because I'm still processing. And I wanted her to stay away from my process so I can continue processing. But this is, you see how my hand's doing? Yeah. That's what processing does. The wheels turning. The wheels, you just, and you just like stuck in the mud, you know, in this fancy car hitting the gas, but you're not going nowhere. So I finally, realized that, you know, let me listen to her, right? Let me get up, even if I don't want to, let me go in here and at least start my day, my 25th day. So it was, it was listening to my wife that kind of, uh, that was the first part that got me out of it. The second part was I realized in me analyzing everything, right? That helping others was a big help to me. So by me stop, by me not being so active on social media anymore, or not going to events and things like that, I'm, that aspect of my life was missing. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just focused on, you know, my situation and my kids and my wife and, you know, whatever issues that I feel that they are versus helping other people 
and helping myself through that. So that's what kind of got me up. I can, I can relate with that a lot. I know it's I'm, I'm in recovery. We don't really know each other that much on a personal level, but that's always one of the things that I was taught. It's like, mm -hmm. yo, by, to get out of myself, mm -hmm. I have to be able to help somebody else, mm -hmm. right? And by helping somebody else, it makes my, my problems, my issues, and things seem a little bit smaller, right? Yeah. Story for another day. Oh, yeah. But we're all in recovery. Of some sort of fashion. I'm, I'd say right now I'm in temperament recovery yeah. because as, as humble as I am, you got people that back in the day said, that guy right there, don't do it. Don't do it. All right? So I'm in temperament recovery. I've been, in, I've been su successfully in recovery for 25 plus years. <laughs> so, so Kino, if you had to say, what was a... What did you use, or what tools have you used to help you establish that balance back in your life again to where you understood now, like, like I say all the time, if Kino's not working, there can be no humbly the greatest. So what tools, what do you anchor yourself in? What is the thing that you can, we spoke about this prior, prior episodes, what can you revert back to that when everything is going out of whack, the one consistent thing you can say is, I can go to this, pay, to this space and pull from this. Listen, what, I, you know, to get on it and get off it, bro, for me, it's the scriptures, bro. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rooted in what the Bible says to me. So that sometimes, don't get me wrong, sometimes that is a help, and then sometimes that's a shining light, you know what I mean? It's like, yo, you, you know, you can beat yourself up because you're not doing this. And that's why I always said the three things, right? A great husband a great father and a great Christian. Those are the most important thing. I don't care about nothing else over that. I'm not saying I don't care, but over those three things, those are the things, you those are the things. yes. And because of what I knew it said to me is what made me say, okay, you know what? I need to deal with my wife this way. I need to deal with my children like this. I need to also deal with my body in a certain way because without me being uh, together, as the foundation, um, then I can't support, right? I used to, before I had a family, have cracks in my foundation, and I would get everybody off of me, and I would go missing. I'd fix it, and I'd come back. The difference is, when you have a family, you can't shake them off of you. You see what I'm saying? Right, so it was, it, was, it was the word that really helped me out, man. And I always, like I said, I'm gonna say my wife again, because she was always on me what I knew to be right through that and what it spoke to me, that's what, that's what put me, that's what jump-started me. So that's what, it, that was what you would say kind of encouraged the 25 efforts. Yeah, because I, the thing about it is, is, and also too, a big thing was I'm not a hypocrite. And, and, and to be honest with you, if I felt like I was being hypocritical about something, then that's when you saw like the blanks in my, in my posting because I said, I can't. So one of the things I always talked about, we talked about this earlier, is I would always say, you know, get up, get going, and get it done. And I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it at the level that I was doing it before. I was still doing it because that's how I had the 25, you know, the, you know, this day. My wife used to hate it. Yeah, here we go, day one, getting big for no reason. She just messing with me, right? That was my saying. Um, but that, that's what it was, man, just me. Uh, that's, that phrase to me, and not wanting to be a hypocrite, and not wanting to be hypocritical, uh, that is what kept me starting and restarting, I guess you could say. And I, I definitely can um, relate to like that 26, 25, 26 days showing up because it's like what we was talking about off camera, like right now it's freaking Ramadan. It's, it's kicking my behind, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, and the difference is, this is my second year doing it. Last year, I was so like, so excited, you know, I was like, oh, I can't wait, this big challenge. Because, you know, I never could commit to a fast before, but it wasn't that I couldn't commit to a fast, I couldn't commit to my word. Mm -hmm. Like my word meant nothing to Corey back in the day, like last, last year. You know, I was like, I wanna say I'm gonna do something and do it. Mm -hmm. And if, I, if I'm gonna do this fast, I'm not gonna eat, I'm not gonna drink, I'm not gonna fold. I get, I get like, horrible migraines, like at hospital admission migraines, like can't move and, and it's always triggered from my diet. So I'm like, you know, I'm stressed. I'm like, I don't want to not drink water and get dehydrated, get a migraine. I had to sit and think, I was like, 
I'm fasting to get closer to God. So how could I be worried about me getting a headache if the purpose of right. me doing this is to get closer to God? I'm going to be all right. Long story short, I didn't break fast at all once last year. I made it through. So this year it was like I'm going into it again, but it's like I, I found myself the first couple of weeks struggling because I, I thought I was fighting the same battle that I was fighting from last year, which was to eat, not to eat and to keep my word to myself. Now I know that I can keep my word to myself and I know that I can make it through the fast. So I'm feeling lost and I'm like, God, well, what is it that I'm supposed to pull from this? What is the lesson? And the biggest thing is what we've been talking about here. It's like every day of Ramadan is not gonna be great. Every day I'm not gonna wake up early and eat on time. Every day I'm not gonna have the proper meals. Some days I may miss my prayers. Some days I may oversleep and don't eat breakfast at all. But the fact of the matter is, is it's not about doing it perfect. It's just about doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and just being grateful that I'm, 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 I'm a human going through a human experience. I'm at Ramadan, I'm at Ma Mosque one day where we're about to break fast. And I slept the day because I, I forgot to eat that morning. And I went to sleep because I got the bad hunger pains. I woke up and I went to Moss, and I'm, it's packed. I'm sitting at the table. No, it's not packed, excuse me. So I'm like, all right, bet. I'm gonna be able to walk up and get me a nice plate or whatever. So I walk up and I don't see no plates available except for the 65 and up seating. So I go to the line to grab food and the guy's like, brother, any plate you see, you can take a seat. I was like, all right, perfect. So I go, I was like, maybe I didn't see any. So I go and there's only thing that's on the plate is a little cup of chickpeas and a, a cup of juice and water, and that's it. And I remember sitting down, and my first thing was like, man, like, I'm freaking starving. They don't got no food. I'm about to eat chickpeas and drink water. And it was like, at that moment, it was like God kind of had to remind me, it was like, what you doing it for? You fasting is so for one, yes, get you closer to me, but to remind you to be grateful because at any moment in time, you can pick up your phone and order food and get water. It's not hard for you. I'm like, so if this is what you got to eat right now, be grateful because this is what people live and work for all day just to eat. Mm -hmm. So I had that moment and I sat back and I was like, you know what, God, I get it now. Now mm -hmm. I know what my lesson for Ramadan is. It's just that don't be so hard, show grace, Corey, but just show up. Yeah. Just keep your word to yourself. And on everything that I love, everything. Some man walked it from the end of the table and walked over to me and gave me a plate full of food. I never spoke to this man a day in my life. It came immediately after I had that revelation, that conversation with myself. Mm -hmm. So it's like I say that to say it's like, bro, if it's 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, things will get better over time, but they can't get better over time if you're not putting in that work. You know, like one of my favorite quotes is, a lot of hear me say all the time, you ain't gotta be great to start, but you gotta start in order to be great. And, and I, think, I think that it, it was listening to what he was saying is that you said that COVID was the shakeup. And I think about some of the things that I went through in life and I looked at the storms to be my enemy. Actuality, the storms was my best friend because the thing that it did to me, it brought me back to me. And it allowed me to see and to hear what I've been missing because of all the distractions. I'm going here, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But when the storm came in my life, I couldn't do nothing but sit still. I wanted to run, but I couldn't run. I got my kids, I had my family, I couldn't go nowhere. So I had to be still and in that stillness, I begin to realize, what am I saying to myself? What am I actually, what is the conversation that I'm having with me that I am ignoring because I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm doing this mm -hmm. and I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. So when it came, I thought at first, oh, this ain't good, this ain't, but it took me years to realize the storms was my blessing because it brung me back to me and what I thought I was great in wasn't it wasn't it at all I was great in just being all of me 
and understanding me. Because, I mean, I'll never forget I had just, there was one time we had bought a brand new truck. <clears throat> and I think a month later, I got released from a gym. I was a head trainer. I was doing like nine aerobic classes. I had clients. So every time a trainer got paid, I got paid. I was making good money. And then all of a sudden, it dropped. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought, first thing I thought, you know, back then I was in church, real deal, that the devil is a liar. It wasn't the devil. It was not the devil. Nothing to do with him. It had nothing to you do with him. You be giving him credit for no reason. Give him credit for no reason, but it allowed me to sit down and question myself, okay, what do you really want? And then I was able to answer the questions that I was ignoring. And I wouldn't even say ignoring. I was scared to ask myself because I didn't believe I can do it. Mm. I was like, ugh. I would see everybody else doing it. But I was up against the wall. My back was against the wall and I thought the wall was my enemy too. I was up in the front of opportunity now. Now you gotta put the time in. If you want it, it'll work. But you gotta get up and go get it. You gotta get up and go get it. And I think about, cause you had said 25, you got, your back at your back. One thing I, 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 I look at is if you came back, there was a level of awareness each time that you can, because I guarantee you can tell us a story with each time you came back mm -hmm. and the awareness gets <clears throat> stronger until where it becomes, it, it gets to a place to where it creates the momentum that we need to just show up for me. Because we know how everybody else in our lives want us to show up. They'll tell you, I need you this, this, this. The kids will tell you, I need you this, this. The boss will tell you, I need this, this. Your friends will tell you, I need Okay, but how do we want to show up for ourselves? Oh, I don't want to cut you off. No, no, you're good. I was, I was actually going to segue that. That's a good way to segue into a question, right? And he talked about, like, transparency and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And you getting online and, like, telling these people, like, yo, like, listen, I, I've been jacked up for a while. Yep. Right, I'm now just getting mm -hmm. on track. And I'm sure at, at, at one point all of us have done that, mm -hmm. but you bringing it to the forefront of your social media mm -hmm. to not just let the people in your circle know, but no, I need everybody to know. Yep. That's one thing I, I posted a video a couple of weeks ago. Like, yo, there's plenty of times when in my life, the outside might look good, right? But inside I'm not with it. And I yep. need to let y'all know that, yep. so that if you see me, ask me how I'm doing. What's so yep. about taking it to social media and, and being transparent and vulnerable, people break, like, what, what does it do for you? So I, I'm gonna try to say this. I told, I told uh, Bones, I was like, listen, I, I'm gonna bring myself a couple of curtures, bro, because I'm gonna touch on some subjects that are just mm -hmm. gonna make that emotion flow over, right? So I'm gonna try to say it in, 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 in as concise a time that I can say it in, right? So first of all, I waited to open the door because I know once I opened the door, I couldn't close it back. Mm -hmm. So that, Am I ready to open this door? And I'll be honest with you, man, part of what, watching, right? So I, watching social media and seeing people like Pope. Hmm. Just that one name. I don't have it in me to say anybody else's, hmm. but people dropping. And they're dropping some for mental health. It just, it, I don't need to cut you off. Like, like the emotion behind it is because of the type of person that she was. Mm -hmm. And you got we sat and like you just watched her just deteriorate. Yeah, oh, full of life, man. Yeah, I'm talking about. Every time I see a bones oh, yourself, bro, how you doing? Oh my goodness. Love you, how's everything been? Pope, I miss you, sister. I'm glad to see you doing good in a relationship. Relationship broke, break, they break up. And she just spirals. But everybody's reaching out. But unless you're physically there for to to be in front of her, she would just it would just tone it would just tone down. Next thing we know, she passes away. They find her in the parking lot. Ten. Ten. So that was part of it, man. People like that, 
people like this is a, a big family, but it's it's real close knit. So I'm like, you know what? We're not talking about what's bothering us. I have to. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things I deal with, man, or I dealt with at the time, was purpose. Mm. Oh my God. As and I, I say as men we need purpose, but as a people we need purpose. Yes. So here it is, and I'm gonna be really honest with you. This hurt me to my heart. You haven't been to my house. I can't wait till you guys come, right? See it. You know I had nothing to do with that. Lost the gig. Can't go on the paperwork. Nothing to do with it. I was missing, bro, during that time. My wife was trying to get this house. And I miss, bro. I'm in here. Can't get out. Can't, can't help her. And then we get the house. And then I'm searching for purpose. I'm trying to make it up to her by cutting the grass, taking rocks from this side to that side, making it look beautiful, you know what I'm saying? My love language, not hers, my love language. And I was like, what am I here for? Bones is true as I tell you. At that time, my life is not my own. I realized my life doesn't belong to me. If it did, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It belonged to my kids, my wife, my mom, who I don't even speak to that much. You know, but she deals with clinical depression. So I'm like, if I do this, she, I'm my firstborn, I can't. Can I, I can't do it as many times, bro. As I'm like, yo, this is it. I just can't deal with it no more. And uh, I was like, I gotta talk about this. So that's why I did. I was like, I know you can tell, yo, these emo- the emotions are there. It's heavy, bro. Mm-hmm. And that's why I say to people, I'm saying to, I'm saying to people, you're not alone, because that's the first thing we think. Yeah. You're alone. Yeah. Nobody understands. Mm-hmm. You're by yourself. You don't have any purpose. Uh, uh, you're weak. Why are you crying? Why can't you be there for your kids? Why can't you be there for your, why, 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 right? And that's why it was important for me. I didn't even plan on doing that video. I just got on the Stairmaster. I was like, you know what? I just feel like recording something. I had no idea what I was going to say. I put it on play and I just spoke my truth. And you know what's funny? When you listen to the video, it was going in and out. It was but going caught, in and out. But you caught the parts. Huh? You, yes. But you caught the parts. Yeah. You heard what you needed to hear. Yeah, I love even the beginning yeah. of it. If you don't like high quality video, yeah. don't because, watch this. No, because I edited it. Mm-hmm. And I deleted it. And I said, no, the editing was taken away. It was taken away the, f- the entirety of what I was saying, the yeah. essence of it. Yeah. So yeah. I... I just did my best to try to edit so you could hear my voice better. Because the problem was I had my headset on, but part of it was. So I left it in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And I put it up like that. If you don't don't like high quality videos, man, just don't watch it. That's that's exactly (laughs) crazy. And to be funny, and you know something? To be honest with you, that's what grabbed my attention. To be honest with you. Because I, I think at times, especially as men, we, we try to be so perfect yeah. because we don't know how to deal with, we're not always going to have it. But society, expectations, we got to work through so many relationships. I got to work through what my mother think I should be, my father think I should be, my, my wife think I should be, my friend. We got to work through all of those relationships and just learn how to, look, I, I don't have it today. I don't have it. I just don't have it. I don't have it. I'm sorry. I'm not giving up. I'm not mm-hmm. throwing a towel in. But right now, I don't have it. Mm-hmm. Give me a don't have it moment. But it's so hard because everybody expects us to be goddamn superheroes. I mean, superheroes, they expect to be, you got to show up strong. What, 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 what do I do if I don't have a strong day? How, how do I, I show up? What if all I got is a hello? If I just got a hello, are you going to accept me 
are you going to accept me if I just bring a hello today? Will I be accepted? Is, is that going to be enough for you? If I just have, I'm here, but if I just come with a hello, is that enough? And, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, what, what, when you said and you felt like you was alone, what, what was you dealing with? What was you hearing that made you feel that you was alone in this? All right, so part of it was, so I've always said you have industry leaders, right? Mm -hmm. And I put them in tears, right? I don't put myself a top tier industry leader. You know, there's others that are doing a whole lot more, but I know that I've established myself in it, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, at whatever tier it is, right? Mm -hmm. People know what I'm known for, and they know that I am, there's no lying in me that I'm honest, right? So it was, <sighs> ask me again, I'm losing what you said to me. What was you feeling or hearing when you <clears throat> felt? Okay, so thank you. So part of it was the fact that by me being that and being that to other people, mm. Uh, it was hard for me to live in the vulnerability because I'm the one that had the answer. I'm the one that people, uh, right? Because as a motive, as a motivational speaker and as a mentor, right? I've always put, I don't know if it's still on my page, but mentor 24 seven, probably had it happen to you. People calling you one, two o'clock in the morning. I have no idea who they are, but I know I'm picking up. Okay. I've gotten out of my bed with my wife and had this conversation with this person. Why? because you don't know me and I don't know you, mm -hmm. but you called me at two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. You need, mm -hmm. you are in need. Mm -hmm. So when you are servicing people like that, serving, right? It was hard for me to serve me. So how do I do it? Can I tell my children? No, because there's a certain way I have to deal with them and try to be there for them. Can I tell my wife? Yes, but no, because we feel like we can't talk to our wives about certain things because we have to be yeah. that rock for them. Yeah. If I'm the support for her, how can I be the support for her if I'm, for lack of a better word, showing weakness, mm -hmm. right? If I'm weak. Mm -hmm. So, Bones knows too, my circle is sometimes small and non-existent, non right? Mm -hmm. You know, do I call my man and say, hey, listen, this is what I'm dealing with? And those times I reached out to you, I could tell you knew, like, damn. And was, that's what it was. I was just reaching out. There's a dude named Tom Chapman. I don't think I know this. Tom Chapman is, is from the UK. He has, he deals with uh, his whole organization. He's a barber, deals with suicide. He hit me up. Mm -hmm. Hey, Keenan, are you okay? I think he saw the signs. Wow. Right? So the thing about it is what had me to, to fully answer your question is just, I just, I felt alone because who do I talk to? I don't have a friend that I'm comfortable with talking with that, you know? I could talk to my brother about it. He is the one person I would understand. But I didn't have the relationship with mom. Didn't have, you know, no fathers, you know, man, they're passed away. There was nobody for me to talk to, man. Mm -hmm. And my wife suggested it. She says, you need to go talk to somebody. I'm like, who? Mm -hmm. And speaking to somebody, you have to feel comfortable. Yeah. Comfort is yes. big. Yes. So I was not comfortable. There I felt like there was nobody I could talk to. I felt like nobody could truly understand it, especially if you do try to say something and then somebody explains it away. Mm -hmm. It's like, bro, I, everything, I just came to you and I tried to tell you this, yeah. and now you've taken that and you've explained it away somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So now that puts you back in the cave. So that's what it was. I just felt alone because I felt like I just didn't have nobody I could talk to. I mean, so that's what made me decide to talk to the world about it. Because... <laughs> You know, that's, if, they're, if I'm feeling this way, there are other people out there that are feeling the same way. Okay. I, feel like that's, I feel like that's a sign of strength, for one. Yeah, yeah, that's the first that's thing huge, that came to my head. That's a huge sign strength. of strength because it was like, I've exhausted all of my other outlets. This last one I got, mm -hmm. and let's just go, let's go forward. Let's I got to figure it out. It was an earn, you earnestly searched for the help. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like that's a, a big gap for a lot of men too. It's like, I hear, I have guys on Instagram that hit me up and it was, they're talking like, Bones, man, like the stuff that you say, like it's changed my life, it's so inspiring. And I be telling them, I'm like, bro, thank you for one, I appreciate it. I said, but I need you to understand the stuff I'm talking about online, that's the stuff that I'm dealing with or mm -hmm. stuff that I dealt with. It's not something I saw on TV and was like, yo, this sounds cool. Let me just re that. No, 
this is stuff that I'm currently dealing with or have dealt with in the past that I have to speak about because if I don't speak about it, I'll hide it. Yeah, yeah. I'll hide it. Like, I, I had an incident, something happened to me when I, was, when I was a kid, and I never spoke about it for years. And then fast forward, I got the opportunity to go speak uh, at a class in Toronto, at a show in Toronto. There's like 3,000, 3, 4,000 people there. And I got on stage, I'll say, when I was a kid, I got, I got molested by my uncle. Mm -hmm. I was like four years old in the bathtub. And my whole life I struggled with understanding, um, I didn't understand anxiety. Yeah. That was my first time I really felt it because I, I, I wrote a poem about it to help me kind of like, it's my form of journaling. And it was like, I remember being in the tub. I know the water is so warm, but why my body feels so cold. And that was my first time experiencing that type of anxiety. So years go on, it never gets addressed. And because it happened to me from a man, I suppressed it and I buried it and I buried it because it was like, oh, I don't like men, but mm -hmm. this act happened to me. So I had to bury that and bury it. And I couldn't understand why I go in the shower and it's like, I get anxiety. I'm, I'm sitting in the toilet for 45 minutes. So I'm getting in trouble and whoop because my parents thinking I don't want to take a shower, mm -hmm. but they don't know when I go in the shower, I got to sit down for 30 minutes to calm my heart rate down because the sound of the water no clue. gives me anxiety. So I'm going through all of that. And then I have my son. And when I have Kai, I noticed that it was hard for me to give him a bath. Hmm. I was terrified of it because I was like, I'm scared. I don't want to wash him around the wrong way hmm. or I don't want to expose him or him feel uncomfortable. So for years, his first early years of his life, my mother bathed him or I would teach him how to do it and have him bathe himself at two, three years old because I, because of my trauma. Yeah. I didn't want to put it on him being his dad. It's like, I got to protect my son. From, from something and it messed me up because I felt, I felt weak, like I wasn't in control. I felt like this, this experience had control over me and it kept me in bondage. And I was like, the only way I can get over this is if I remove the shame from it. I gotta remove the shame from it. I didn't ask for this. I didn't do this. It happened to me, you know? Uh -huh. And I questioned God for years, but then I had to understand. I was like, we're just a, you're just a vessel. You're just a mouthpiece. Nothing that happens to you is for you. Selfishly, we want it to be that way so that way we can understand the emotions and justify why we're feeling this way. But it's not for you, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I understood that, so I started writing about it. I wrote the poem about it. I spoke to my dad about it and I went to Toronto and everything was going bad at that trip. And I remember getting on the phone with my dad. I was like, dad, I'm, I gotta come home. Cause it was, in the, it was in the midst of me building a shop. I'm broke. I'm broke. I didn't even have enough money to get another room out there. And I was like, dad, I gotta come home. He was like, man, he said, it ain't supposed to be easy, but you gotta tell that story. And I got on stage, there's about 3,000 people in there. And I got to speaking and I got to that part and I could hear the clippers in the building at the booths turning off. I could hear the music at everybody's booths getting lower. And it was like, at that moment, I had a decision to make. I was like, I'm either gonna let this thing control me and this fear keep my mouth closed or I'm gonna stand in this and speak up because there's, there's gotta be somebody in here that's went through this. Mm -hmm. There has to be, there's just one person. I gotta share it. And I said my, I spoke my truth, but then I gave the tools on how I overcame it. I didn't just go up there and be like, woe is me, this is what happened. I say, this is what happened to me, but this is how I made it out. And I'm still fighting to this day. I was vulnerable. And because I was vulnerable, when I got off stage, I had like 15, 20 grown men come up to me, he was like, yo, the same thing happened to me. And it was like, at that moment, it was like, growing up, I never understood. I'm like, bro, how God, how you let something like this happen to a kid? You know, I was, I felt like my innocence got taken away. 
that I got exposed to sex so young, I didn't go looking for it. Like, mm -hmm. why am I fighting a battle mm -hmm. that I didn't desire? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't crave a woman. I didn't crave sex. I was trying to, I was taking a bath for my uncle. Mm -hmm. But it, it made sense that moment when those men came up to me and said, bro, thank you. Thank you for getting up there because I could never do it. And I was like, I got it, God. So now when I get on my videos and I'm on the gram and I'm talking about these things that I deal with, I have to do it. Because if I don't, I internalize it. And then I make it personal. And when you make the emotions personal, that's when they get control over you. Because if your emotions are controlled by different situations, you're not in control no more. That person or the incident is. So by you getting up on that treadmill on day 20, on that 25th attempt, you wasn't getting up there for Keno. It had nothing to do with you. You got up there for your wife, and you got up there for them boys, and you got up there for the people who know who you are and your character. You got up there for me. Because mm -hmm. I, I look up to you, and I, I admire you. And, uh, I remember as back at Heavy Hitters, I would come home and tell my dad about the conversation that we had. It's like, Dad, there's a barber at the, barber at the shop that's Jehovah Witness, and he's the first one I ever met like this. Yep, all the time. And I was like, I don't know if I agree with everything, but I got so much respect for him, Dad, and he's got a lot of knowledge, and I'm gonna keep talking to him. So I gotta say to you, thank you for coming for the 25th time. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Because you don't, it ain't, it's, it's not about you. And that's the thing I, I'm learning now as a father is like, the expectation is on us because we have a responsibility. Your testimony, if you don't share your testimony, people's lives will be affected by it. I seen Inky Johnson say that he was like, if I didn't go through the things I went through and didn't share what I shared, you know how many people would die? You know how many men would further on that generational curse, if I didn't get up there and I didn't speak on that, if I don't put this in my book, if I don't share this on this platform, you know how many husbands have been in that same position as you are? And they need to see a nigga that did it anyhow? Well, only thing I could do was cut the grass, make sure the dishes is clean to cook dinner, and put the TVs up in the house and make the game room for the boys, or rub your feet when you came home from work or have people turn their back on me because I'm not gonna fold on my relationship and the husband I am to you? It ain't about you, Kino. It never has been. That's why you'll get up at two o'clock in the morning and talk to people when you're in the bed with your wife. One of the things that I did that kind of, uh, I don't know if it helped or it hurt. It was hurting for a point moment because I called myself being in a, in, a, in a time of processing because social media was changing and how you create content was changing. So I started to, you know, consume content, I'm watching this content because I'm trying to learn how to create differently. But I went from being a creator to a consumer. Mm -hmm. And I got a little upset not really upset, I was just irritated with what I was consuming. Not saying that it doesn't have value because there's several people out there that have great things to say about how to be a better barber, yeah. how to cut hair, how to make more money. What I wasn't seeing is anything about mental health. Yeah. I wasn't seeing anybody speaking, not in our industry, speaking the truth, not enough. And from that point, I shut down the social media. That's why you didn't see me on it, because I wasn't, I sh all three of them, shut them down, because I, I couldn't continue to go on here and see the same things over and over again, and there's nothing that, it, it's not helping me, it's hurting me, because I'm getting lost in this. Uh, I would watch something, acts of kindness used to bring emotion out of me. Okay. because you don't see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm seeing an act of kindness, and it's like, I can't believe people are still doing that. One of the things that I didn't do is I chose not to do is I, 
I'm not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent, but I feel like if you're doing an act of kindness for somebody, that's not a recordable moment. Yeah. I agree. Yes, I agree. Right? I had something like that happen just the other day. It's just, I get it, but then the flip side to it, because I understand, but that, I feel like that's where- Some people need to see that. It's, yeah. it, yeah, and the thin line has got to be, we never know the intent of that person's heart because there's videos that I see that people do things and I thank God they did because it inspires me to want to do it too. So it can bring awareness, but then there are people that do it yeah. for themselves, you know? It's but then there's fine. genuine people out there that are like, bro, like, like the MD motivator dude, like where he'll just go up to people, he'll, he'll be like, um, do you have something uh, yes. to eat? Yes. And if oh, I don't have anything, he's like, can you lend me a dollar? And they give, he'll give him a thousand All bucks, the tell their whole story. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. I watch his dude's videos and I freaking, yeah. I'll be crying. Those are, those are the ones that were hitting me, man. And we need, the, and, but, that's what you, but that's, what you, that's what you were doing before. But you were just doing it in person. Yeah. Perfect example, Allison. Allison didn't know how to educate at all. She had one conversation with you. So mind you, I've never said this to everybody. Yeah. But yeah, and you walked her through on how to educate. Yeah. And now Allison's one of the best educators on the level three, on the level three team. Shout out to level three. Make sure you go to level3.com for the team. <laughs> She's one of the best educators on our team now, and she puts a lot of that credit to the conversation that she had with you. I think as we're going we gonna to wrap it up, if we wrap it up, I wanna, the one thing I want to say is, Kino, you have so much value. So much value. And I'm thankful and I'm grateful that now you're in a position to where you're allowing yourself to show Kino grace. And that's a big thing. Cause lo and behold, whether he gonna say it or not, I'm gonna say this forever. I'm the one who got this nigga to start posting on social media. <laughs> Cause when we was at heavy hitters, when we was at heavy hitters, I was telling Kino, I was like, Kino, bro, like you gotta post. When, no, when nobody, everybody in the shop was saying I was tripping. Am I lying? When I was telling people, let's go to shows, let's post on Instagram, nobody wanted to do it. I said, Kino, bro, your haircuts are good, like your flat tops, your retro cuts, like, bro, post it, post it, come to these shows, post it, post it. The moment Kino intentionally started working on his social media, it blew up immediately. He has, he has all the tools, but you had to go through all of that because now you had even more value to give. Yeah, my mission is different now. You have even more value to give, and I can't wait to see it and watch. And hopefully, we can get you, we'll get you back on here again. Yes. Have have some more conversations for sure. Yes. But with that being said, we're gonna wrap up this episode. I just want to say thank you, Kino, man. You know I love you. Got a lot of love for you. I appreciate your time. Yes. I appreciate your transparency. Definitely your vulnerability today, because what we say it ain't for us. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That we're not up here trying to talk about the things that we went through to get a pat on the back. Yeah. We're doing that because the common man needs to hear and needs to see somebody that looks like them, speaks like them, the same age as them, in the same industry as them, that's gone through the same things as them, yes. make it out. And know that every day ain't going to be perfect. It ain't going to be perfect. Every day ain't going to be perfect. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Sure. If it get to 50. That's 50 first days. That's 50 days in the gym. <laughs> That's it. That's There's it. There's got to be some type of progress that comes That's from that. Right. That's but right. But for the, the viewers, please, man, thank y'all for tuning in. Please like, comment, share, subscribe. Like, if you got any questions that y'all want to ask us, any topics you want to discuss, please just drop it in the comment section below. Stay tuned. Again, Bones the Goat. Pop Greg. Kino Valley, Valley, humbly the greatest. That, that's a wrap for another episode of Conversation That Cure. Appreciate y'all. Take care.